So I don't think I know everyone. I'm Lorraine Lally, I'm Dean of Students at the Law School. I want to welcome everyone to our National Law School Mental Health Day event. Um, so I bring um, greetings on behalf of the Law School, but also especially from our Wellness Committee um, that was newly formed this semester to help bring wellness, health and wellness initiatives um, to the Law School. And the members are myself, Brianna Klein, Amanda Weber, Justin Kishbaugh, Alicia Pina, and who am I missing? And Jolie Vackey in admissions, who I think can attend today. Um, and so it's been really great to have a group of people focused on the health and well-being of law students. Law school is super stressful, and we want to try to support you, um, support you as you go through this. Um, really thrilled that people are here. I see members of our counseling center staff, members of our professional staff, students, and anytime you have an event, you're always worried, will people come? And I just really appreciate everyone taking a time out of your busy um, schedule, especially with the holiday weekend coming up, um, to think about wellness and to think about stress, anxiety, and depression, and how it impacts us all. So I'm going to turn the mic over to um, the the board members of Phi Alpha Delta, who um, really get all of the credit for helping <laughs> bring this event together. Um, Kaylin Pelletier, where'd she go? Former, um, former justice of PAD, um, came to me last semester um, with this idea um, for this program. And I'm so pleased that um, through your support, we were able to have it happen. So I'll bring Amanda and um, Brianna up from PAD. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Dean Lally, for those remarks. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself quickly. My name is Brianna Klein. I'm a 2L, and I'm the justice for Phi Alpha Delta. Um, we're really happy to have um, Mr. Lukasik here this afternoon. Um, and I just wanted to give a quick thank you to Dean Lally, um, the rest of the Wellness Committee, Amanda, and the rest of our e-board. Um, without all of you guys, this wouldn't be possible. So thank you guys for all of your support and all of your help. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Weber. I'm also a 2 well and I am the Vice Justice for Phi Alpha Delta. Um, I am beyond thrilled, humbled, honored, anything under the moon to introduce Mr. Dan Lukasik. Uh, he was my first boss, so it's a little bit of a full circle here. Um, so Dan Lukasik graduated from the University of Buffalo uh, School of Law in 1988. He has been a trial lawyer for over 30 years and is listed in the publication Best Lawyers in America. Ten years ago, after being diagnosed with major depression, Dan created a weekly support group in his community of four attorneys who struggle with illness and a website, lawyerswithdepression.com, which is very active, and if you have the chance, look at it. It's updated constantly, as well as the Facebook. I get a lot of my material from there, so he takes all the credit for that. <laughs> and it's the first website and blog of its kind in the nation to help law students, lawyers, and judges cope and recover from depression. His work on mental health has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and then CNN, as well as many other national and international publications and media outlets. He has lectured across the country on the topics of stress, anxiety, and depression at law schools, bar associations, and judicial groups. Dan is the executive producer for an original documentary, A Terrible Melancholy, Depression in the Legal Profession, which is where we kind of stole our title from. <laughs> and is the recipient of the Public Service Merit Award from the New York State Bar Association and the Distinguished Alumni Award for, for Public Service from his law school and alma mater uh, for, for his work in this area. So without anything further, I give you Mr. Dan Lukasik. Thanks, uh, Dean, and thanks, Amanda, for that kind introduction. Uh, greetings from Buffalo, where I just flew in from this morning. Um, I feel as if... Um, some good things are happening with the issue of mental health uh, in law schools and the legal profession because I've become kind of a road act. You know, I've go, been going from city to city to city. Next week I'm in Columbus, uh, Ohio, speaking at Capitol, and the following week at Yale Law School, speaking to their law students. And I really uh, feel passionate about this topic because we really have so much in common. You know, I was a law student like you are now, and in the not too distant future, you'll become a lawyer like I am now. And uh, I'm here to talk about stress, anxiety, and depression in law schools and the legal profession. And I want to start uh, by telling you a brief story, which is, I call it my opening statement. 
Uh, I am currently 57. Uh, I'm a trial lawyer uh, and have been for almost 30 years. I began uh, my training as a lawyer trying cases in New York City in federal district courts there and state courts. And at the time I was, when I'll soon to tell you the problem started to happen, I was the managing partner at our litigation firm. So I had a lot of responsibility uh, both as running a business and trying cases. Somewhere when I turned about 40, things started to go off the rails for me. Um, I really didn't understand what was happening to me. Uh, I started feeling profoundly sad much of the time. Uh, I started, my sleep became kind of fragmented. I'd wake up and uh, I never felt rested. Uh, my concentration started to fade. And all when this was happening, I remember feeling terrified because I didn't understand, uh, you know, and you know, I'm an educated person like you were as well. And I thought I knew about depression, but I didn't know anybody with depression. And I didn't think I had depression. So something dramatic started happening to me. And um, it wasn't getting better, it was getting worse. And this certainly showed at the law firm where my productivity went down. I started adjourning things. I had my door closed the majority of the time. When people would walk in, I put as many files and books around my desk as I could to look busy. Um, but ultimately, uh, I kept praying things would get better, but that didn't happen. And at some point, what was the tipping point, uh, I lived maybe about a half hour uh, from my office to my house. And when this was going on, it was in the dead of winter, so it was very dark. So I'd drive home in the dark uh, by myself. And I recall uh, seeking out abandoned parking lots. Uh, looking for a target or a place like that and going into the back of the building where there was nobody and it was dark and I would just start crying, 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 crying for no reason that I could articulate. There wasn't a specific reason why I was crying, but it could go on for 15, 20, 30 minutes and I'd get in, you know, start the car back up and go back home. Nobody knew about this and I think what was distinctive about this was normally when we cry, right, it's an emotion expressing grief or loss, we can feel better, right, when we cry. Uh, this didn't happen to me, you know, crying beget more crying beget more crying. There was no catharsis involved with the crying. So at some point, uh, I went to my family doctor, explained my symptoms, and he referred me to a psychiatrist. And that was really uh, the loneliest experience of my life because I, I made a, a point of picking a psychiatrist deep in the suburbs in an office park where no one would know I was even, I mean this sounds silly now maybe, or it might sound silly to you, but at the time I was worried that someone might see me, a, a colleague, a, a judge, uh, an opponent lawyer, so I was really scared to go. My wife didn't know. My best friends didn't know. So I go to the psychiatrist and I go into the waiting room and it's a large waiting room. Maybe it had like 30 chairs in it and there's no one else in there. So this seemed to like underscore how painfully lonely this experience was for me. And I waited and I waited. I must have waited an hour, you know, for the psychiatrist to call me. He finally did. He said I had major depression, and he put me on some medications. The difficult part of his uh, treatment was I had to take three months off of work. So I'd have to tell my fellow partners that I needed to do this. And I wasn't going to tell them that because I had break, broken my leg or, you know, I had some other kind of disease or illness, but because I had depression. So I called a meeting with them, and uh, there are three of them and uh, they're all litigators, professionals like me, and in a kind of a quaking voice, I told them what had happened to me and that I'd need to take this time off. And um, it's really interesting, their responses, and I think they're typical of the kind of responses that many people get in our society at large, but in particular, 
in the legal profession where mental health issues are, there's a lot of stigma attached to them. Um, but the first partner said to me and shook his head and said, you know, Dan, why don't you go on a vacation? You know, you know, what is the problem here? You know, you got so much to be grateful for. You have a beautiful wife. Uh, you're an accomplished lawyer. You know, you make a good salary. What is the problem? You know, that was his answer. The second partner was silent. He was looking out the window. We were in a huge high rise. He didn't say anything, you know. And in many ways, that was the most painful response. Because I, I imagined the worst, you know. There was no offer of support or anything like that. The third partner was kind of like a network news anchor. Real handsome guy, you know, perfect hair, megawatt smile, and always, always in a happy mood. No matter what, what was going wrong with the firm or what was going right. So he was listening and nodding his head as I was talking and he was smiling like, like this. You know, it was so disconnected to the message I was telling him. But he said his response was, Dan, you know, you, you at 90% is better than any lawyer I know. So, but the truth of the matter was, and I told him, I wasn't at 90%, I was more at 10%, 10% of the person I used to be. And I think that looking back on it, what I think is important to, to recognize was that the first lawyer, the take a vacation or get over it kind of response is so typical, right? You know, for people who don't know about depression or who've never experienced depression, the quiet or cold shoulder treatment is also very common. Sometimes people don't know what to say or sometimes in their own mind, the thoughts are percolating that, you know, this guy can't cut it, you know. What's his problem? This is a tough profession. We're all stressed, you know. So that's how they, they calculate it in their own minds. And the third partner, I think the way he approached the problem was to diminish it, you know. Maybe this will, you know, this is not as bad as you're making it out to be. So, you know, you're not as productive as you were before. No big deal. Hoping it would go away. But it didn't go away. So I took those three months off, and it was the summertime, and I remember going, I have this Starbucks that I always go into, and there's a lot of judges and lawyers that circulate there in the morning. And for whatever reason, you know, I, I can't fully explain it, I didn't want anybody to know that I was taking time off. So I would go to that Starbucks, continue to go there during that break, in my suit, with my briefcase, as if nothing had happened. As if no one, I didn't want to take any chance that anyone would ever know, where's Dan? Where is he? You know, why isn't he in court? So I would shower, shave, get in my suit, my briefcase, get my coffee, and then after all the lawyers or judges left for the work day, I'd go back home and go to bed. So that was my experience for about three months. At some point, it came time to go back to work, which I dreaded because I wasn't well, I wasn't fixed or healthy. And what was most striking to me, and I'll talk about stigma a lot today, uh, what was most striking to me was that, and I worked at a large firm, no one said, welcome back, or, you know, are you feeling better, or, gee, is there anything I can do? It's like silence, silence as if I, I'd seen these people yesterday, but I hadn't seen them in three months. And I think it was this sense of tension, like do not disturb the apple cart, do not talk about this issue, you know. Looking back on it, you know, at the time I was really hurt by that experience, and um, that's why I think I can speak, speak so strongly about stigma, because I experienced it deep in my bones. And I think when I look back on it, clearly everyone doesn't have uh, a hard heart or they're not you know, dismissive, dismissive of me. They weren't dismissive of me, but they just didn't have any reference point for what depression is. And I think most people 
in our culture, and maybe uh, in the legal profession, think of it as um, sadness, right? I did, you know, but what's the difference? I'm often asked this, what's the difference? And I think there's a profound difference, and one of the things that, <clears throat> best explanation I ever read was by this guy, uh, who's a uh, psychologist in New York City, the best-selling author, he's in the documentary you're going to be seeing today, uh, Dr. O'Connor, and he said he confused depression, sadness, and grief. However, however, the opposite of depression is not happiness, but vitality. The ability to experience the full range of emotions, including happiness, excitement, sadness, and grief. It's not sadness or grief, it's an illness. And I think that encapsulates uh, much of my experience, and it took me a long, long, long time to understand that depression or clinical anxiety are illnesses, right? They go from the mild end to the more severe end, but at some level, there's neurochemical changes happening in the brain. There's hormonal change, uh, changes happening in the brain that make it an illness. So I think we all know, you know that depression is a big problem in our culture. Maybe we don't know how big of a problem it is in our culture and our society. But depression is the leading cause of disability in, in, in this country and in the world right now. Um, when you think about it, or I tried to think about it visually for you guys, 20 million people, 20 million people at any point during a year I diagnosed or live with depression. So to do the math, that is 250 football stadiums. That's how many people right now as we're talking are suffering from depression. Not sadness, but true clinical depression. Now let's bring it home to what does that mean to you, to you guys? I mean, it's gonna mean a lot as you'll soon see because the depression rates for law students and lawyers according to these large studies that just were conducted are much higher, much higher than the general public, uh, the general population. This study was conducted uh, last year and they surveyed, I think it was 15 law schools and thousands and thousands of law students from around the country. So these are your, um, your future colleagues, these are your, your classmates, right? And they found that 37% had anxiety, 17% had depression, and 21% had suicidal thoughts. These numbers are two to three times higher than that experienced for regular folks around the country. So something's seriously going wrong, right, with mental health in law schools. Why, um, why is law school so difficult? Well, they've identified a bunch of reasons. You probably have some of your own, but here were some of the most um, cited reasons, pressure to get good grades, the Socratic method, pressure to get good summer jobs, excessive workload, lack of human connections, fear about a job after law school, and poor self-care, you know? So these things, I think, and what we're, they're trying to do here at this law school and law schools across the country are trying to reverse this trend by making um, mental health and mental well-being a, a higher uh, value in how they teach you. Um, they also did a study last year on lawyers. And this, was, this covered, it was another big survey, and they surveyed over 12,000 lawyers from around the country. And what they found was uh, depression rates of 28%. That's four times the national average. Okay. Suicidal ideation, 11.5%. That's five times the national average. Okay. If you try to get a sense of the proportion of that, um, there's 1.2 million lawyers practicing in America today. So if you plug that depression rate in, 
That means that 365,000 lawyers across America, or roughly the size of the population of Pittsburgh, are suffering from depression right now. The same study found also problems with anxiety and stress, okay, about double the national average. And I think this is significant because, uh, for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons it's significant is that most people with a mood disorder, such as depression, also have an anxiety disorder. It's called comorbidity. And they believe it's because uh, the part of our brain that regulates our moods, the limbic system, is involved, deeply involved with anxiety and depression and actually stress management. So many people with depression and anxiety are not good at stress management. Uh, when, I, when I was talking about that with a fellow lawyer, I said I wasn't very good, and it certainly it had a role in my developing depression. How ironic is that? I'm a trial lawyer, and I'm very busy and very stressed. Um, but that's the problem. You know, people who are successful don't necessarily, aren't necessarily good at managing stress. I mean, uh, the best example is that at law schools. Uh, you're all very accomplished, otherwise you wouldn't be in law school. But many of you are not good at managing stress, just like I wasn't, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, some causes. Uh, for me, I like to think of it as the perfect storm. Uh, in my family, in my family tree, there's a lot of people with depression or bipolar or addiction problems. I wasn't, I, I never thought I would be one of those people because I didn't like to drink, smoke, take drugs. I was a good kid, good kid, uh, who got good grades. But looking back on it, uh, they believe that as much as 50% of um, people who develop depression have a genetic component to it. The other thing that's important to recognize, and there's a lot of research being done on trauma these days. Uh, I had a traumatic childhood. My father uh, was a severe alcoholic, and I, he died from alcoholism when he was 56. And I imagine that if uh, we look back on it and he was evaluated, they would have determined that he had either depression or bipolar disorder. You know, at that time, uh, they didn't have uh, many resources to, to, to uh, diagnose someone or treat them. So I brought that risk factor with me into law school, right? Genes, trauma, personality. Most lawyers, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, they've studied this, and not surprisingly, many, many people who go into law school and become lawyers are type A personality types, right? They're self-starters, uh, they're driven, uh, they're perfectionist. Uh, they are, can be kind of pessimistic, okay? So there's a certain personality type that generally goes into law. Many, many, many exceptions. But the studies have shown that there's that link. And finally, and I think that's true for me, uh, personality-wise, but finally the stress of being a lawyer. <clears throat> and when I talk about stress, I often say, you know, stress is a very good thing. Uh, for much of my life, and I think even now, people are motivated by stress, so there's good stress, right? What I'm talking about is chronic, unremitting, perpetual stress, which humans were never, didn't evolve to handle that kind of stress in their bodies and their brains. So much of the law practice today and uh, the experience of many lawyers is that there's just too much stress involved in the day-to-day -day life of being a lawyer. So for me personally, and each person may have a different story, it was the perfect storm of these things that I think coalesced and created de depression for me. Um, I mentioned personality. This is just a recap of what I was talking about. Highly ambitious. Uh, how many of you, raise your hands, can, can identify with some of those qualities? Oh. More than a couple, okay? Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting, um, pessimism. Um, 
When we talk about pessimism, and this has been researched and written about as it relates to lawyer personalities, what it means is not so much uh, is the glass half empty or half full. That's not what we're really talking about. It's really, it's called a cognitive explanatory style, all right? So it's a way of looking at the world in a negative way, all right, that puts you in the position of you're always looking for trouble, all right? You're always problem solving. You're always on your uh, toes thinking something bad's going to happen, okay? And I, as a lawyer, and many, many, many hundreds and hundreds of lawyers I've talked to around the country said that is dead on. And why is that dead on? Because I'd walk into a courtroom or in a deposition and I'd be scanning my environment looking for trouble, looking for an opposing counsel that was going to be a jerk that day. I'm thinking, oh, I'm in for a long day, right? I better get my back up. Or it might be something as um, I'm sitting at my desk and uh, I see a fat package come in uh, from an opponent and it's a, a motion, um, you know, on a case. So you develop that capacity and I think it's often something, uh, they say it's, you know, you learn to think like a lawyer. They say that in law school all the time or they did when I was a law student. We're going to teach you to, to, to think like a lawyer. Well, part of that thinking is this kind of thinking. And what they found is that lawyers uh, who have this quality are very successful people, okay? The problem is, the problem is, it, while it may make you very successful, it doesn't go a long way as far as establishing good mental health, right? People who are pessimistic don't necessarily have depression, but most people who have depression are pessimistic or negative thinkers. So that's another risk factor, right? When we think about depression and what causes it and why lawyers have so much, so many problems with that. This is what I mean more specifically when I talk about stress and perpetual stress, okay? Fight or flight, the adversarial nature of the profession, winners, losers, time crunch, little time for self-care. Some people, when I lecture on this, and I lecture to judges and trial lawyers, they will say, well, you know, that's just the way it is. You know, it is an adversarial profession. There are winners and losers. And, uh, or they might say most of these problems are attributable to trial lawyers or people with big law firms. And the studies just don't bear that out. These depression rates hold constant across people who are in government and private practice, solo practice, big law firms. So there's something going on in the culture uh, of the law. And that culture begins in law school, right? And then it continues on into the legal profession. The thing that I had the most difficulty with, um, I think, was number one and two, and then the last one. I had always grown up uh, in my family, it was a dis dysfunctional family, this is an understatement, but I was always kind of like the, the, the good kid, the, the overachiever, the family hero in my family of five, five kids. So I got along by always being a kind of a pleasant conciliatory person. And this idea that all lawyers or trial lawyers or litigators are pit bulls is just false. Some of the nicest people I've ever met have been trial lawyers. But there are, there is a group of people in, uh, in that uh, uh, litigation group that are like that. And those are the people I would dread the most. Uh, and uh, when that happened, when I got those people, immediately my heart would start racing, my, I would sweat. Uh, I was terrified. You know, you couldn't show any of that, but I was. So. I had the most difficulty with the adversarial nature of the profession, and consequentially, I also had little time for self-care, which was a big problem. Stigma. The studies that I showed you earlier about law school uh, and the high rates of uh, law students with depression, um, what was interesting uh, was that not only 
where there are high rates of law student depression and anxiety, is that most of them didn't seek out any treatment of any kind, whether it be with a, uh, uh, co the counseling department at the law school or at the university or off-site, okay? So they attributed most of the people who, who responded to the study said the, the biggest reason was um, stigma, you know, being identified as somebody who had a mental problem or uh, they cited privacy concerns or they talked about uh, what's going to happen if my future employer finds out about this? Do I have to, what if it comes up on the character and fitness uh, part of becoming a lawyer? So that's a big deal. And I think what we're finding is that law schools and uh, across the country and law firms and the legal profession is saying this isn't working, you know, stigmatizing people because what's happening is the depression rates and anxiety rates are not going down, they're going up. By, historically, they're going up. So there's a high cost to be paid uh, with stigma. Uh, I think for me, and I, 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 it's different for every person, but in my family I experienced stigma because many, many people in my family, it was really uh, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps kind of family upbringing. My dad was a World War II veteran, uh, a kind of meat and potato, you know, have a beer every night kind of guy. And uh, certainly talking about one's feelings or one's mental health problems uh, weren't common at the dinner table. Uh, so uh, people experience uh, stigma at their job. They can experience with it in their family when they come home. And I think there's also this uh, side of stigma that's an inside job, right? Many, many people with depression feel tremendous shame. You know, they feel like they're less than or that they're, they're losers, I've heard that a lot, or that they're broken people, you know, they're not good enough or those kind of things. I think that's true because depression is such a powerful experience um, for most people. And What's interesting is that uh, when you go through a depression, many people with depression, everything shuts down, right? They appear flat and emotionless and lifeless, but they actually know that a lot is actually going on inside a person's brain when they're depressed. Uh, I started with an opening statement, so I'll, I'll have a closing argument, uh, which is some thoughts I have on this topic. How many of you have taken trial technique? Oh, gee, this is a bad slide then, you know. <laughs> Are you saying to yourselves, I don't know what a closing argument is? Well, it's at the end of a trial, and I've had to give a lot of them. Uh, usually, that's not a good sign if the jurors look like that, you know, if they have that kind of expression on their faces. Uh, and I've had a few juries like that. Uh, but um, what I wanted to say, and I think we're getting to the point that we all recognize uh, what the problem is, right? Too much stress, toxic stress, anxiety, and depression in law schools. We, we know there's a problem. Uh, we now know and have identified some causes, right? We outline them here. Law schools are responding, beginning to respond, as is the general legal culture. <clears throat> But I think uh, the proof is in the pudding with the recent study on law students that stigma is still a dominating factor that prevents uh, law students from getting treatment. That's nationally true. On a national level, that's true. Eighty percent of people nationally don't get any treatment for the depression or anxiety. Uh, law students, it's about 50 percent. That's still a lot, a lot of people not getting help. And I've been to too many law schools across the country uh, where law students have committed suicide. Just too many. At every law school I've spoken at. Um, so when I, when I talk about this, I often, that's why I don't come with a, a to-do list of uh, things you can do. Uh, you know, what can I do to feel better? What can I do to treat my depression? You know, I, I'm not going to do that today because I think many of you probably know what those things are, or you can easily go on your smartphone and find out what they are. 
exercise therapy medication. All right. So what I'd like to conclude with is to, to challenge you to think about these conditions differently. Okay. So what does that mean? When I was a kid, this was my superhero. He really was. And you may, you may uh, know Superman uh, with different actors, you know. Uh, but when I was a kid, Christopher Reeve, when I was a teenager or a young man, he was Superman. And he could fly and do all this cool stuff. And he was my hero. But something as you may know, some of you may know, or all of you may know, the person who played that character had a tragic accident. How many people know about that? Raise your hands. Well, this will make the story even better. <laughs> the, the, you know, he was involved in that accident where he was horse riding and was going over a fence, went face forward and broke his neck, and was in a wheelchair the rest of his life. And, uh, one time, I think it was on CNN, I actually saw him interviewed, and they asked him, you know, what is a hero? What is a hero? You know, people, when they looked at him, uh, thought he was very heroic in what he did. And this is what he said, which has always stayed with me, and it's something I have on a card in my wallet. A hero is an ordinary individual who finds the strength to persevere and endure in spite of overwhelming odds. That stayed with me a long time, I don't know why, but then it worked its way into my thinking about stigma and how people still view people with mental health problems uh, in a poor way, right? I mean, they do often, too often. And how people struggling with these conditions view themselves that way. Right? They're ashamed, they're broken, they're never going to make it, they're never going to be successful. So, in many ways, I think this fits, fits well with what I'd like to leave you with in some measure, and that you could take that quote, finds the strength to persevere. And I think in your profession in your law school time when you're here and when you go on to become lawyers, perseverance is a huge uh, part of being a successful lawyer. Huge, you know. Um, there's some kind of saying that, you know, the, the kids who were on law, law review and got A's and that stuff, they all became like appellate judges. So most of them are not real lawyers. That's what, you know, my friends and I would say. The majority of people who are the B and C students, right, they're the working stiffs like me. You know, you go out and you got to work for a living. You're not on the appellate division. So I would find uh, over my career uh, the most important quality next to hard work, because you're going to work hard as a lawyer, as you do as a law student, the biggest thing uh, that kept me going was perseverance, getting back up, you know, when you're knocked down uh, in a case or in a legal matter, you'll lose. It's a win-loss kind of game oftentimes. Getting back up and going forward, all right? That lesson applies equally to mental health, right? It applies equally because when I think of people who struggle, and there's millions of them walking around, you know, how many people are there here today? I'll, I'll say 50 for the sake of argument. 60 would be easier. So that means 20 of you have a problem right now with anxiety or depression. So if you don't have a problem, look to your left or right, and somebody probably does, right? And that person's going through a tremendous uh, battle every day to keep going to class, to show up on time, right? To keep up with everybody. And that demands a lot of perseverance. And in my view, that is a very heroic thing. Heroic. The complete opposite of stigma, right? These people might not wear like, uh, you know, 
shiny medals on their lapel. We don't have parades for them or bumper stickers. But in my experience over the last 10 years, some of the best of the best of the best of the people I've met persevere and are people who struggle with mental health problems and who go on to achieve amazing things. So I checked that box and they endure in spite of overwhelming odds, right? Just like going into the law. You know, you're the creme de la creme. You know, it's not easy to get into law school. You're very privileged to be part of this great tradition, this history of uh, being part of our democracy. So you had to endure and overcome a lot of odds, right, to be here. And then, you'll have to par pass the bar exam. I was just talking to somebody who just took it, good luck. <laughs> it's it's an ordeal, but you're gonna have to endure that and overcome it. Um, but getting back to depression and mental health, it's, it's really the same thing because uh, mental health conditions, many people, when we talk about depression or anxiety, Yes, there are solutions. Yes, there are solutions to treating these conditions. But if you talk to many people who suffer from them, you'll find out pretty quickly, if you don't know already, they live with them. Most people do. So in fact, they not only have to persevere, they have to endure. They have to keep going. They have to keep hoping that things will get better. And when I talk about overwhelming odds, I mean, when we think of heroes, that's what we think of. They've done something special, right? And that's how I think of people, uh, law students and lawyers, who go into this extraordinarily challenging profession, really tough profession. And if that weren't enough, they're also carrying with them this tremendous load of uh, mental illness, right? That is a heroic, thing. And so for those of you here who have one of these conditions, you're a hero to me. I mean, I, from the bottom of my heart, I feel that way. For those of you who don't suffer from one of these conditions, you should really think about how you view somebody when you're told, if you're fortunate enough to be told that someone suffers from one of these conditions. They're not less than, uh, they're really heroes. They really are, you know. So, um, thanks for your time. I didn't, I, I didn't have a lot of time to cover an enormous topic. We could have talked probably for a few hours. But I think um, I wanted to get now to the documentary. And I'll tell you very quickly what that is. A few years ago, uh, we received three grants to create to hire a documentary filmmaker, and the topic is depression in the legal profession. So we interviewed lawyers, uh, law students, a judge, uh, an expert in psychiatry, an expert in psychology, and a Lincoln scholar. Now, why Lincoln? You'll find out. So I don't want to tip my, t tell you too much. Sit back and just watch the film. Give a huge thank you again to Dan Lukasik, the deans, and our wellness committee. And then just a quick little something for traveling all the way from the law school. Show our appreciation. Oh, it's food. <laughs>